today on Dr. Phil. A father accused of killing the drunken driver who hit and killed his two sons. The horrific accident. My son kept on calling out my name. He was trying to stand up. He didn't have legs. What happened that night? I remember hearing gunfire. I was hurt. I was, I was destroyed. I was screaming for help. And no one coming to help. No one. What were your last words to Caleb? The murder trial. They automatically pointed fingers at my husband. This man that ran into you, did you shoot him in the head? The exclusive interview. Are you sorry he's dead? This is the Barajas family. When they took this photo, they had it all. Love, health, and happiness. Then, one fateful night in December 2012, everything changed. David and Cindy Barajas had no idea that when they left for a family dinner, their world was about to be torn apart. By the end of the night, two of their children would be dead. 911. Um, we have a wreck. Um, uh, ran over. Um, oh my God. Oh my God. Yes, he is on bleeding badly. He is badly hurt. Then, after facing every parent's worst nightmare, this loving father, David, would soon be facing life in prison, accused of murdering the drunk driver who killed his sons. What would you do if someone crashed into your car and killed not one, but two of your children right before your eyes? Would you be capable of shooting that man dead? That's exactly what police accused David Barajas of doing, taking the law into his own hands. It's a story that had the entire nation talking. Just two weeks ago, David's trial came to an emotional close. Today, he is speaking out for the very first time in an exclusive interview about the story that ripped through the headlines. Two brothers were hit by a car and killed while helping push their family's broken down truck up the road. Investigators say the driver of the car who hit them is also dead. Jose Bonda, 20 years old, was found in his car with a single bullet wound to his head. Witnesses reported hearing gunshots shortly after Bonda's car slammed into a disabled truck. Yeah, there's a gunshot. There's a gunshot. Somebody's shooting a gun over there. Go, 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 go. Prosecutors are trying to prove that as his children lay dying in the street, the grieving father took the law into his own hands, fatally shooting Bonda in the head. Investigators spent the morning inside the Barajas home executing a search warrant. We turn now to a small town murder that has many asking, was it a revenge killing? Prosecutors say Banda was shot and killed by this man, David Barajas, who had just lost his two sons in a crash involving Banda. Barajas' DNA was found on the victim's car, and a 357 ammunition was found at his home, just 100 yards from the accident scene. Prosecutors told the jury that the evidence will show that he was seen confronting the victim, Jose Banda Jr., right after the accident, and that witnesses saw him approaching the victim's vehicle right before they heard a bang. Not guilty verdict for a Brazoria County father. It's acquitted of murder charges after prosecutors argued he shot to death a drunk driver who had killed his two sons. The 32-year-old cried when the not guilty verdict was read. The jury deliberated for less than three hours. We believe that Mr. Barajas committed this crime, and we also know that the jury did not believe that beyond a reasonable doubt. We respect that. According to the prosecutor, David got away with murder. What do you think? You may have one opinion right now, but once you hear David's side of the story, you may change your mind. David and Cindy Barajas sat down with me along with David's criminal defense attorney, Sam Kamek, to describe what they say happened that night. Hello. Hey, how are you? How are you? Hi. Sam Kamek. Sam, Phil McGraw, good nice to meet you. Hi. Cindy Barajas. Cindy, nice good to meet you. David, Dr. Phil. First off, uh, let me say, uh, as a father of two boys, I'm so terribly sorry for y'all's loss. I can't even imagine what it must be like for both of you. This is an important story to tell, and I want people to understand the gravity of what's happened here. Tell me, just in your own words, what happened that night? 
we were going out to eat. I let the, my sons choose where they wanted to go. And chose the Gringos Mexican restaurant there in town. <clears throat> After that, we went to um, Walmart. It was close to Christmas time, so we were letting them look around so that we can see what kind of things they wanted and right. get some stuff for the baby. The baby was three months old, right? Yes, sir. And then you had a daughter. Yes, sir. Who's eight. So all of y'all, there were six of you together, right? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. You decide to go home about what time did you leave there? Around 11. I was driving. That's when the truck died out, 300 feet from the home. Did the truck run out of gas? I do not believe so, sir. The, the truck had fuel. Those trucks are notorious for engine problems. My fuel gauge was reading that I had fuel. Uh, I know in the media and in the tabloids, everybody was saying he ran out of gas. How could you run out of gas knowing? But we had fuel. The truck had just died. I remember looking at the gas tank and it saying there was more than a quarter of a tank of gas. I remember looking at the gas station and we kept going. I was driving and I decided to get out and, and, and push. We were, it was- We the, called first, a lot I, of people. No, I, I did call. I called my father, my brother, a good friend of mine, and just my luck, nobody answered. And I called repeatedly before we got out of the truck, so we were still sitting in the truck with the hazards on. We were gonna walk across the street because it wasn't that far from our home. So we figured we were just gonna all get out. Was your house up ahead and on the left-hand side? Yes, sir. Is there a shoulder on the road or? No, there's a ditch. I assume when you get out of the truck, these boys want to help, right? Yes, sir, that was it. I didn't ask them to get out. That road is dark. There was no, no lights in sight whenever I got out. They kind of follow me. So daddy gets out, the boys get out, they want to help daddy. They wanted to prove how strong they were. And my 11 year old wanted to prove that he was stronger than his 12 year old brother because he was bigger in size. So he's like, I can push it by myself, watch, watch. You know, people sit there and say that we're not responsible parents. We have to live with two life sentences. Parents are not supposed to still be here longer than their children. We're supposed to part this world before they are. You say, people say you were irresponsible parents. What do they mean you were irresponsible parents? The fact that we let our boys get off the truck. They were big boys. Our 11-year-old weighed about 175 pounds. He had bigger legs than his daddy. Is this the one that was the football player? They both were. We go to pushing and... And you we were on the driver's side? I was on the driver's side of the tailgate, yes, sir. My son Caleb was in the middle next to me, and my son David was to the passenger side of the tailgate. If I may, I would like to show you one picture that doesn't have any blood or injury or anything. It's just a picture of the side of the pickup. May I show that to you? Do you know whose handprints those are? I've never seen this picture before, but Do you know Sam, are those the prints of the boys, or is it David's, or? No, I believe that's a print of one of the boys. It appears to be on the passenger side above the wheel well. That's where David got out. It uh, happened so fast, they just barely got out, and it was just... It was just a big explosion, just out of nowhere, and I didn't see no lights no breaks, reflecting. No nothing. So there were no headlights? No, sir. A and it was a dark-colored car? Correct. So you had no idea? We had no idea. Not even a split seconds warning. Cindy, how long were the boys out of the truck before the impact? They had just got out and barely started pushing. <sighs> just enough time for me to get in the driver's seat, look through the mirrors, and then give them give a little push, and the next thing you know. You slide over to steer and then explosion. What did you think had happened? I didn't know what happened. I just 
It was so fast, it was just like out of nowhere. It threw me. I ended up in the ditch on this side of the lane. Across the road? Yes, sir. You get out the driver's side. I run around the front to get my daughter on the other end so that she doesn't try to get off the truck. And you wanted to keep her inside? Yes, sir. But by the time I ran back there, she had already got off. And she seen my younger son, Caleb. Has she told you what she saw? She told me that she's seen him without his leg. He was trying to stand up. And he didn't have both legs. So he fell back down and he was calling for us. So I didn't want her to see that. So I grabbed her and took her and my baby to some, you know, people that were on the side of the road. I just got to explain to her that, you know, everything's intact now. I don't want her, you know, remembering her brother like that. She's just a 10-year-old little girl, and she was born into having her two big brothers, and that being taken away not from just us, but from her too. And what was her reaction at the time? I just remember her screaming. You then take her to some people that were now had come to the scene. They're just bystanders. Yes, there. sir. So you can go back. I ran back towards the boys, and David's my oldest, and he's the one that was in the ditch. And where were you at this point? Well, I, I had got thrown, and that had also uh, broke my right hand. My wrist was broken. But when I had got up, my ears were ringing. I remember him screaming for the boys. I was, I was looking saying, for them. Son, son. I remember looking and not seeing anything. I didn't even see my truck that was 250 feet from the point of collision. So when I had got up, I didn't see. I seen the car and smoke, like the car was smoking, but I didn't see my sons at all. As I'm looking for my sons, I get attacked. Two males come up and start hitting on me as I'm beside the driver's car. I was trying to see who was in the car. Who attacked you? And why would anyone attack a victim at an accident scene? Coming up. I remember sitting there screaming, asking the police officers if they can help me stop the bleeding. No, 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 no. Nobody helped. What made you feel the need to say that? And later. Did you approach his car and shoot him in the head? No, sir. If you didn't shoot him in the head, who did? We now return to a Dr. Phil exclusive with the father acquitted of murdering the drunk driver who killed his sons. David Barajas claims that he was attacked right after the accident by the drunk driver's cousin and half-brother. During the trial, Jose Banda Jr.'s cousin testified that while there was a confrontation, it was David who was the aggressor. Why would anyone attack a victim at an accident scene? I still, to this day, don't know. Well, we know who attacked him. I mean, they testified under oath that they attacked him. After going through the trial, we heard testimony of who it was. So you find out that it's his cousin and half-brother. Correct. That were following behind him. I remember seeing a light-colored vehicle drive around, and I remember seeing two people running. I don't know if they got in that vehicle and then they left with that car. I just remember seeing a light vehicle that went around us. I had to get out of the way because they were going right past me. And Dr. Phil, she described that to the to first responder that she saw this light colored vehicle with three spoke rims come in and leave the scene. Now they're gone and this is when you start finding Caleb and then ultimately David. Because this all happens before you've ever even gotten to your sons. Correct. And as soon as I made it to the front of the vehicle, I had seen my son, Caleb, his legs severed. And he was moving around. 
and I went down to him and I, I don't even remember what I was telling him but I know I was on him next to him trying to hug him I remember seeing his his leg under the vehicle but I grabbed his leg and put it next to him his shoe was still on his leg all I could remember is him just looking at me and I said son squeeze my hand you know I'm with you, 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 you we're gonna be okay it was graphic. I was hurt. I was I was destroyed. Oh, it's indescribable the way I, I felt, and I still feel that way. From what I recall, from the top up, he looked good. It was the legs that were hurt, and that's what led me to believe at the time that he was going to make it. And then she was yelling, David, so I ended up running to David, and when I ran to David, I remember seeing his chest and his stomach moving, so I didn't think that he had passed. And I was saying, breathe, son, breathe. And I was giving him CPR. I refused to, to stop. I kept trying. I went to Caleb. I remember holding on to his hand and asking him to pray with me and um, screaming for help. And no one coming to help no one it was just you know you sit there and you think maybe it's just a nightmare that you're living and there's no way in the world people could be so cruel but nobody assisted did you hear Caleb call out for you yes what, what did he say he was just saying mom and that he was looking for his brother I remember sitting there screaming and asking the police officers if they can help me stop the bleeding. Nobody said anything. Screaming out that my kids didn't have AIDS for someone to please help them. You can't get AIDS! You're fucking! Oh, Nobody helped. What made you feel the need to say that? Because they didn't want to touch them. <laughs> Why do you think that is? I have to tell myself that maybe it was graphic for them. They just didn't want to hear our cries. Once the ambulance showed up, it was so graphic, they kind of were like hesitant to he get had to, He had to pick so up my I had, son I and put him on the stretcher. And put him on the gurney and help them load them. David, when you were with Caleb, did he speak to you? I don't remember him speaking to me at all. He was more in shock. I seen eye movement and I seen him moving, but I, he didn't talk to me. I held I, Caleb's hand and at first I told him everything was gonna be okay until I seen all the blood. And I remember asking him if he knew what we learned about resurrection. And he squeezed my hand and he nodded yes. <laughs> So, you know, just the thought that he still had hope and faith. David, what were your last words to Caleb? I love you, son, and I'm sorry that all this happened. And you're going to be all right, son. You're going to make it. I love you, and I'm going to the hospital with you. That were my last words. Coming up. He said that it was a crime scene and that I needed to leave. I asked him, I said, how is it a crime scene? And he said, if you step near here again, you will be arrested. They threatened to arrest you if you went to your dying son's body. Yes. We now return to Dr. Phil's exclusive interview with David and Cindy Barajas. David Sr. was standing behind the truck in this area, and Caleb was in the middle, and David was on the outer portion. Probably within eight to 10 seconds, there was this huge explosion. Caught in the collision were David Barajas and his two sons. According to police, 12-year-old David II was pronounced dead at the scene within sight of the family's front yard. Was David conscious when you got to him? He was laying there. I didn't see anything wrong with him. 
I didn't see anything wrong with David. A little bit of blood from his nose. I didn't think that mm -hmm. he was dead on impact. I remember touching his stomach, and he felt cold. <laughs> he wasn't breathing. <laughs> At what point did the two of you realize that both of your sons were gone? He never realized. He didn't stop giving mouth to mouth to my son. He was still holding on to him. But they didn't let me go back towards my kids. They said that if I did, I'd be arrested. I wasn't allowed to go to the hospital to be with my son, who was still alive when he left on my flight. They threatened to arrest me if I did leave. He said, that it was a crime scene and that I needed to leave. And I, I asked him, I said, how is it a crime scene? And he said, if you step near here again, you will be arrested. So even though my son Caleb was still alive, I... So they threatened to arrest you if you went to your dying son's body? Yes, after they took him in the ambulance, they said that he had uh, passed out and uh, that he was in and out of consciousness. Now, this man that ran into you, I, I understand that he was like twice the legal limit intoxication-wise. Is that what you understand? Yes, sir. Did you ever talk to him? Did you approach him? Did you? have any interaction with him at all? No, sir. My only approach was when I had tried to approach the car at the very beginning and had got attacked. You, you never spoke never, to him? Never spoke to him. I never went back to the vehicle. You remember him yelling anything or asking anything or saying anything? No, sir. I was too occupied about the children. I didn't go back and, and check on anybody in that car or... Did you know that he was drunk driving at the time? At the time, no, sir. I mean, I guess one thing that what's important to know is that that was always the state's theory that this guy was driving, but he was found shot to death in the passenger seat of the vehicle. But he wasn't in the driver's seat. Nobody saw where he was. Nobody saw him in that vehicle. But they found his body, I mean, after he'd been shot, and he was in the passenger That's seat correct. then, right? Yes, sir. That's what we learned. At when when you approached the vehicle, did you, were you approaching on the driver's side? Yes, sir. Was there anybody in the driver's seat? I don't recall, sir. I really don't recall seeing anybody. I just, I remember the attacking and then running to my son. Now, his cousin, who was, we now know, was one of the two people that attacked you, because they testified Correct. to that, right? Yes, sir. He testified that you punched the driver. I don't recall ever punching the driver or, touch, or seeing the driver. But in, in testimony, they were saying that the reason they had attacked me because they thought that I was punching the driver. He testified that I was punching him through the driver's window through the trial, and the pictures were exposed. The driver's window of the vehicle was still up, and the other guy said I was hitting him through the back window. So it kind of really didn't make sense to me. Well, you sure didn't punch him through a closed window. Correct, that's right. impossible. Did you hear a gunshot? I do not recall any shots. I just remember being attacked and uh, being with my children. They were my first priority. Well, after this Jose Banda Jr. impacts your car and fatally injures your two sons, did you approach his car and shoot him in the head? coming up. You understand how a casual analysis of the situation, I mean, not digging into the details, someone says there was a, a family driving along a road, they have car trouble, a drunk driver plows into them, fatally wounds their two sons, and a couple of minutes later, that drunk driver is discovered shot dead in his car first guy I'm looking at is you. We now return to a Dr. Phil exclusive with the father acquitted of murdering the drunk driver who killed his sons. 
two teenage boys that had been leaving a Christmas party that night heading home, they pulled up and saw the wreck and got out to assist. David Braha Sr. had walked up to his vehicle and said, don't let this guy leave. Don't let him leave. He just hit my kids. Call 911. Well, after this Jose Banda Jr. impacts your car and fatally injures your two sons, did you approach his car and shoot him in the head? No, sir. No, sir. If you didn't shoot him in the head, who did? I couldn't tell you that, sir. I, 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 after living through the trial and seeing and hearing everything that we heard, I was convinced that he was already shot. I felt that he wasn't even driving that night. It's unfortunate that it took us to have to go through trial, and it took us to have to have Mr. Kamek basically play detective to put the puzzle together. Basically, there was just pieces all over the place. No one cared to put anything together. They just figured, OK, he has a motive. Let's point fingers at Daddy and move on with this. You understand how a casual analysis of the situation, I mean, not digging into the details, someone says there was a, a family driving along a road. They have car trouble. A drunk driver plows into them, fatally wounds their two sons, and a couple of minutes later, that drunk driver is discovered shot dead in his car. First guy I'm looking at is you, because I'm just putting myself in your situation. I, I'm not saying it's right, but I'd be lying to say I wouldn't want to shoot the son of a bitch. The only reason why, it was a few nights after the boys had passed away. We were laying in bed, and I remember him asking me if I did it. He looked at me, and he said, if you did, you know, I would take the blame for you. You know, him saying that, you know, proved to me that there's no way that he could have done, done it. Why did you ask her if she had done it? I didn't know the details that night. I I was struck, I was hit, I was thrown, I was hurt. It was all in and out for me. I didn't really know, and everybody was throwing it on me, and I don't recall it. Have you ever shot a gun? No, now, yes. You've learned to shoot a gun since then? I don't know how to shoot one other than the fact that I've gone to a gun range as far as I want to learn how to protect myself. You live every day looking over your shoulders to make sure that there isn't anybody there because they automatically pointed fingers at my husband. But up to that night, you had never shot a gun? No, sir. Did you have a gun in your home? No, sir. But they said they found a holster and ammunition in your home. My husband does car sales and buys used vehicles and resells them. The holster and ammunition were found in two separate vehicles. I buy uh, vehicles from an auction. They come with all the trash that's left behind from the a previous owner. I happen to find the box of bullets under the back seat of a truck. Everything I bring in the house that day, I set them on the dresser. That's where the bullets were at on top of the dresser with the rest of my knickknacks. The holster was in the washroom. I actually thought it was at like a cell phone holder or like a tool, the little compartments that you can put on a tool belt, on a carpenter's belt. That's what I thought it was. Well, I assume you've shot a gun before. Yes, sir. Yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm a Texan. I mean, I, I don't know anybody that shot, shot a gun in Texas. Did you have a gun in your car? No, sir. Did you ever leave the scene of the accident? Coming up. I've done the math on the timeline. There was some theory that you had run to your house, gotten a gun, come back, shot the driver, uh, somehow got rid of the gun. So you don't believe there was a gunshot at the scene at all. We now return to Dr. Phil's exclusive interview with David and Cindy Barajas. During the trial, David's defense attorney, Sam Kamek, laid out a timeline of the night based on three different 911 calls that were placed after the crash. Do the 911 recordings 
proof that David simply wouldn't have had enough time to kill Jose Banda Jr.? The first 911 call came in at 11.33 p.m. Listen. 911. Yes, um, we have a red. Hey, what road is this? Hey, what's what's going on? Um, we have a uh, red. Um, uh, a cable is ran over. Off, um, do y'all know what county road this is? Why are they screaming? Do y'all need an ambulance? Yes, yeah, so we, we definitely need an ambulance. Okay, what happened? Um, I'm not sure. So, uh, a cable got ran over. That same caller testified during David's trial that he saw David disappear and leave the scene of the accident for approximately three minutes. Did you ever leave the scene of the accident? No, sir. I've done the math on the timeline. There was some theory that you had run to your house, gotten a gun, come back, shot the driver, and then uh, somehow got rid of the gun and changed his clothes and washed the blood from everywhere inside the house. In a minute and 24 seconds. I want to be sure I understand this the way you do. There is a gunshot. Well, that's the first gunshot, right? At 11.35.08, that's when the first gunshot was heard, at a distance, we believed. And then a minute and 24 seconds later, at 11.37.14, the first police officer arrived on the scene, according to his dash cam. OK, so that's? two minutes and three seconds after the first call. That's correct. So with their theory, in two minutes and three seconds, you as a father said, forget them. I'm going to sprint home, get a gun, take the hard drive out of the security system, race back, shoot this guy, dispose of the gun in some way, and then get on your knees over one of your son's for the arrival of the dash cam. And wash the, wash the gun residue off, the gunpowder oh, yeah. residue. Of course, you got to get the gun residue off your hand. So under the best of theories, you didn't have a lot of time to do all that, as I understand what you're saying. So the 911 operator hears this over the phone. The car and the driver are still there? I think so. I'm pretty sure. I need to make sure that they didn't try to leave, OK? At 11.35 p.m., less than two minutes into the first 911 call, the caller yells that he heard a gunshot. According to David's attorney, that left less than two minutes for David to run the 100 yards to his house, get a gun, go back to Jose's car, kill him, hide the gun, and clean up his tracks before police arrive on the scene at 11.37 p.m. The prosecution claimed the gunshot heard on the 911 call was David shooting Jose Banda Jr. According to David's attorney, the caller was about five feet away from the drunk driver's car when he heard the bang. I want you to listen very closely to that portion of the 911 call again. The dispatcher asked if the driver has left the scene. When the caller is responding, I don't think so, a gunshot is fired. The car and the driver are still there? I think so. I'm pretty sure. I need to make sure that they didn't try to leave, OK? Yes, yeah, there's a gunshot. There's a gunshot. David's attorney argued that gunshot was too quiet to have been fired at the crash site. Well, we wanted to see what a gunshot would sound like over the phone from five feet away. So we did our own test. We fired a 357 Magnum five feet away from someone on the phone and recorded the call. This is five feet. Here's what it sounded like. As you can hear, that bang was louder than the one you heard on the 911 call. But there are a lot of factors that could explain why. The 911 caller's voice might have overpowered the sound of the gunshot. The shot could have been muffled by static on the line or the sound could have been drowned out by noise canceling technology, a common feature on most smartphones today that eliminates background noise while you're on a call. These boys had testified that they were within five feet of someone described as Mr. Barajas, who was standing close to the driver's door when supposedly a 357 Magnum went off. Well, it sounded like a shot 
way off in the distance, which we believed it was, it was a half a mile down the road. So you don't believe there was a gunshot at the scene at all? Coming up. I mean, you're, you're grieving the loss of two sons. You, your daughter has witnessed this horrific scene. How did you feel when you found out on top of all of that, I'm now being investigated for murder? We now return to Dr. Phil's exclusive interview with David and Cindy Barajas. So you don't believe there was a gunshot at the scene at all? I do not believe there was a gunshot at the scene. I mean, I believe that the prosecution and, and law enforcement uh, desperately wanted there to be a gunshot at the scene, but I don't believe it. Did you know that they were suspicious that you were the shooter? Yes, sir. Well, they swabbed him for gunshot residue that, that night, night within that night. an hour and a half. And found nothing? Nothing. Prosecutors allege after the crash, Barajas went into his house, retrieved a gun, and then shot Banda once in the head. Bullets similar to the one that killed Banda were found in the Barajas home. But the murder weapon was never found, and no witnesses identified Barajas as the shooter. I mean, you're, you're grieving the loss of two sons. You, your daughter has witnessed this horrific scene. How did you feel when you found out on top of all of that, I'm now being investigated for murder? Uh, I, I, and it was unbelievable to me. I couldn't really, didn't really know how to take it all in. I've been upside down since the, since December 7th of 2012. It's just nothing's been the same, but it's, I didn't know how to take it. I wasn't going to run from it, you know, I had to face whatever was coming my way. It's just something we had to live with whether we wanted to or not. I had to get out of that courtroom more than once because he had no choice but to stay seated. But you're sitting back and basically watching a movie because you're, you're thinking, how did this happen? He was looking at life in prison. Our kids were taken away and then you sit there and you're willing to take away a man's life not knowing not having any evidence, you know? If he, in fact, was driving that car and killed your children, are you sorry he's dead? Coming up. We sit there and wonder, you know, why didn't God take us instead? Do you, at any level, at any time, blame David for what happened? We have barely scratched the surface of this story. Tomorrow, is David glad the man responsible for killing his two children is dead? And if David Barajas didn't shoot Jose Banda Jr. on that deadly night, who did? Plus, another news story about a family torn apart in an instant. A popular reality star from the hit show Sons of Guns was arrested on charges of raping a 12-year-old girl. William Hayden is behind bars awaiting trial. Tomorrow, his Sons of Guns co-star and daughter, Stephanie Hayden Ford, joins us in an exclusive interview. What does she think about the allegations against her father? Tomorrow on an all-new Dr. Phil, Sons of Guns star arrested. William Hayden's in jail on child sex charges. His daughter's exclusive interview. Your sister confided that he had been molesting her since she was 11. Do you believe there are other victims? Shocking new accusations. Tell me what you say happened between him and you when you were 12. Plus, the shocking police video from the night of the accident. And the heartbreaking aftermath. You relive it over and over again. Do you, at any level, blame David for what happened? That's tomorrow. Now, we are very concerned about the Barajas family's future. As you know, often we will ask viewers to join us in supporting extraordinary causes. And if you feel that this is one of those cases and you would like to join the Dr. Phil Foundation and support the continuing expenses this family will have as they move through this challenging time, please log on to drphil.com and you can learn how to help. Thanks for watching.
thousand times Memories can kill ya But I didn't hear ya I thought that I could fly But woke up on the asphalt I swear there was the last time mm -hmm. 